Today's episode contains strong language. Please be advised. April 1995, West London. Lelicia stops at a crossing, tucks a loose strand of blonde hair behind her ear, and quickly rushes over the road. She's late to meet a friend for lunch. She glances back, not for the first time. The man in the blue anorak is still there. He's been following her for the last 15 minutes. Lelicia tells herself she's being paranoid, but just to be sure, she ducks down a side street. It's much quieter here. There's no one around. But when Lelicia glances behind her, to her horror, he's still there, about 10 yards away. She can hear his feet on the pavement, his heavy breathing. Lelicia picks up the pace. What was she thinking turning down this alleyway? She has to get back on the main road. Her feet are pinching in her heels. She's desperate to take them off, but if she stops, he'll catch up. She sees the traffic of a main road and runs. She can hear his running feet as she makes it to the corner, grateful for the bustle of people. Then she trips. Her knee hits the floor with a crack. Oh, God. She cries out. The contents of her handbag go flying. Tearful, Lolicia turns to look for the man. But he's gone. Lolicia arrives at the restaurant, mascara streaked down her cheeks and bleeding from her knee. Her friend rushes to her. She's led to a table outside and given a huge glass of white wine. Which is the universal cure for a bloody knee. On a woman. (laughs) After a few sips, she begins to relax. Finally feeling safe. Even a bit silly. Is she imagining things? Lolicia's friend talks about the awful divorce she's going through. Lolicia counts her lucky stars for her happy marriage. Looks to camera. She's missed Jonathan terribly while he's been away on his ski trip. And I'm sure he's been thinking about her every second. But he's back the day after tomorrow, and right now Lelicia's glad of the distraction. She sympathizes. These awful men, the audacity to think they can be unfaithful and get away with it. They're pigs, the lot of them. The waiter brings out their main course when Lelicia sees a flash of blue. She spins round, and there he is again. The man... Staring, coming straight for her. Lelicia sees him reach into his coat for something. She scrabbles from her chair. Mrs. Aiken, how's it feel to be married to a pimp? He pulls a camera from his coat and snaps it in her face. Lelicia is completely stunned. What is he talking about? She recoils from the camera, trying to hide her face. Did he ever pimp you out to his saddie mates? Lelicia tries to make sense of what's happening. Everyone's looking now. People on the street have stopped to stare. Why is no one helping her? The man's still clicking his camera when suddenly a second photographer appears. He jeers at Lelicia and throws a handful of photos at her. Lelicia catches a glimpse of Jonathan, then a scantily dressed young girl. She feels her stomach turn. She looks back up at the flashing cameras, the crowd of people, the look of disgust on her friend's face, and realizes her life as she knows it is about to come crumbling down. From Wondery, I'm Alice Levine. And I'm Rob Delaney. And this is British Scandal. So, Rob, we've been acquainted with Jonathan Aitken. In fact, you have brought him alive You do need to sort of separate yourself from the character, I would say, because at times you are merging into one. So I'm glad that you've stepped out of his skin for a second. And back into the skin of Carol Thatcher, who I think very obviously is my favourite character to play. The fact that they're the only two options is really disturbing, actually. (laughs) Well, they're like the two poles. (laughs) What do you make of him? I dislike him a lot, based on what I've been learning here. But I have to admire the audacity. I mean, I can't believe how hard he goes for it. Something's different about his brain. Yeah, the ambition, frankly, the charisma, like the charm, that mm-hmm. is, that's a mm-hmm. common thread with some of these megalomaniacs. And also the ability to just keep on doubling down. <laughs> I mean, he seems to be flying high. He's 
pretty much untouchable, is on his way to number 10, unhindered. But on the other hand, he's going down this very dangerous path. He's in bed with the Saudis, Uh blinded by the big two, power and money. Deafened by sex? (laughs) Exactly. But, you know, at the end of the last episode, there was that plucky journalist with a lead to follow. Always a plucky journalist with a lead to follow. And that was Mohammed Al-Fayed's tip. Uh Mm-hmm. He's got evidence of Aitken's shady relationship with the Saudis. And that's the relationship that's going to catch up with him today in Episode 2, Lies Under Oath. Whether you're a Sherlock Holmes aficionado or not, you're going to love the latest instalment in Audible's original series, Moriarty, The Silent Order. It's a follow-up to last year's smash hit thriller, Moriarty, The Devil's Game. And this time, Holmes and his nemesis have to set aside their mutual loathing and work together to defeat a truly evil force played deliciously by Helen Mirren. Dominic Monaghan and Phil Lamar are also back in their starring roles, and so are the amazing Twists and Turns. We know you're going to love it. Listen now at audible.com slash silent order. Bring peace of mind home for the holidays with Blink Smart Security by Amazon. Blink's best prices of the season are alive with up to 60% off cameras and systems. Deals start at $19.99 with the popular Blink Mini. See what's happening at home from your smartphone with crisp HD video, two-way audio, motion detection, and more. Help protect what matters most with the all-new Outdoor 4. Shop early and save on Blink's best deals at Amazon.com slash Blink Wondery. That's Amazon.com slash Blink Wondery. December 1993. Guardian Offices. London. Guardian editor Peter Preston holds the letter he's drafted in his hands, double-checks the signature he's just forged. He places it side by side with a copy of an official document he's obtained from the House of Commons. It perfectly matches the looped handwriting of Jonathan Aitken. Peter needs it to be perfect. If he's caught, he could be arrested for fraud. Should be arrested for fraud, yeah. He punches the Ritz number into the fax machine and feeds the letter into it. Since Mohammed Al-Fayed tipped him off about the Saudis paying Aitken's hotel bill at the Ritz, Peter's been like a dog with a bone. Fourteen years of Tory rule has brought his country to its knees, and Aitken embodies everything Peter hates most about the party. He's rich, smug, and entitled. Peter wants nothing more than to knock him off his perch, but despite working on this case for over a month, he still has nothing to show for it. Al-Fayed is refusing to hand over official receipts, so Peter has decided to take matters into his own hands. He's forged a letter from Aitken asking for a copy of the receipt. Because in truth, this story is taking up too much of his time. His other work is suffering. One way or another, he needs to put it to rest. Oh, sorry. I didn't know it's because it was laborious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, fine. I just thought you were doing it because, you know, you were lazy, but it's just like yeah. too long. Yeah. Wait 30 days and be inconvenienced two or three times and then you can. <laughs> Ten minutes later, the fax machine springs into life. Peter races across his office. He's taken aback by the speed of the response. Then starts to fear he's been rumbled. He watches anxiously as the document prints out at a painfully slow pace. It's the receipt. He snatches it up from the tray and scans the page. The dates of Aitken's stay, 17th to the 19th of September, the amount, 8,010 francs, and the name of the person who settled the bill. An Arab name, Saeed Ayas. Peter grins. Al-Fayed was telling the truth. Peter takes the receipt in his hand, grabs the phone, and punches in eight digits. Jonathan Aiken? Mr. Aiken, it's Peter Preston from The Guardian here. There's a pause, then Jonathan replies. How can I help you? I believe you stayed at the Paris Ritz Hotel in September. Peter waits. That's correct. Was that on ministerial business? Jonathan pauses. I'm sorry, Mr. Preston, but what is it you want? Peter tries to control his breathing, his excitement. I've got a copy of your Ritz bill here, and it says it was paid by a Saeed Ayas. Mind if I ask who that is? Peter feels the air change down the line. Then silence. I understand you are at the Ritz with a group of Saudi royals? Peter listens as Jonathan appears to muffle the telephone receiver. Then his voice cuts through. My wife paid that bill. So I'm afraid the information you have is incorrect. Right. 
And your wife's name is Mr. Saeed Ayas? Mr. Preston, you've clearly obtained this information by dishonest means. And if this smear campaign continues, I will pursue legal action against you for fraud. Sounds like an innocent man. Peter smiles. He's been in this game long enough to know when someone's on the back foot. Aitken's got something to hide, and Peter's convinced it runs deeper than one receipt. But Peter knows he needs help. He's the editor of The Guardian, for God's sake. He has to get back to his day job. He needs a heavyweight to take over, an investigative supremo. And he thinks he knows just the man. January 1994, a nursery, East London. David Lee squeezes his large frame into a small pink plastic chair. He pushes up the sleeves of his moleskin coat then takes in the scene before him. Children's paintings hang from a string across the room. David looks at the clock. He's got 10 minutes to get what he needs before the end of break. A source to go on the record about Jonathan Aitken. David jumped at the chance to take this case. He'd like nothing more than to knock a self-satisfied Tory boy like Aitken off his perch. He's built a reputation as one of the country's most fearsome investigative journalists. He's brought down entire governmental departments. Ministers with something to hide fear him. And he's been trying to nail a Tory sleaze story for years. This one could be huge. John Major's government is almost daily rocked by story after story of Tories caught in ever more compromising positions. But Aitken could be the biggest yet. He's even tipped to be the next prime minister. At the moment, though, evidence of wrongdoing is thin on the ground. David's seen his Paris Ritz hotel bill. But the question remains, why is a Saudi businessman paying for a cabinet member's hotel stay? I'm desperately trying to think of an above-board reason for that. He's hoping that Aitken's former secretary, Valerie Scott, might be able to answer that. Val's back! <laughs> hey! Val! He looks up as she enters now. She must be in her early 40s. Blonde hair tied up, a little grey at the sides. She's wearing yellow dungarees. She perches nervously on a table. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have long. David cuts to the chase. I was hoping you could tell me about Jonathan Aitken's relationship with the Saudi royal family. David sees Valerie's eyes darken. She looks away, her gaze fixated on something beyond the room. He senses her discomfort. Valerie, if you're scared of repercussions... She snaps back. I shouldn't have even known anything. It was only because Jonathan confided in me. David watches her fingers anxiously twisting a ring on her thumb. What did he confide in you? David can already feel her pulling away. He needs to tread carefully. Anything you say will be anonymous. You don't have to go on record. Valerie studies him, steps forward. Look, this isn't recent. He, he was chairman of the British Saudi Parliamentary Group in the 70s, and he's involved with the Saudi arms dealers. Haven't you done your research? Outside, there's a clap of thunder and a sudden downpour. Children scream and run into the building with their coats over their heads. Sorry, I, I'm not prepared to say any more. David wants to keep on her, but the room's filling with sodden kids, and it's clear the interview is over. Outside, David runs through the rain to his red Ford Escort. He pulls the door shut. Inside, he takes out his notebook. He writes down British Saudi Parliamentary Group. And milk. It's a start. He's going to need to trawl through business records, talk to former employees. There must be someone willing to go on record. Someone willing to make an enemy of Jonathan Aitken. 20th July, 1994. Downing Street, London. Jonathan's car pulls up outside number 10. Jonathan takes a minute to adjust his tie. He's been at loggerheads with the Guardian for months now, and he's exhausted. He steps out into a haze of flashbulbs. He stops outside the big black door and waves to the cameras. He puts on his best charmer's smile, trying to look confident. A charmer's smile not completely dissimilar to a con man's smile. <laughs> no, they use the same muscles. Truth is, he's trying to convince himself as much as the press. Prime Minister John Major's just announced a reshuffle. 
Jonathan got the call to come in last night, and he's determined to take the next step towards the top job. Inside, Jonathan takes in the former PMs on the wall. He hopes today he'll take one step closer to his dream of joining them. He makes his way along the corridor to Major's office. Sits opposite the Prime Minister, who pushes a plate of biscuits across the desk. This is so British. You've done a sterling job as Minister for Defence Procurement, Jonathan. I'd like to offer you a job in the Cabinet. Jonathan's heart skips a beat. It's actually happening. But Major pauses, looking at Jonathan. There is one thing. Jonathan meets Major's eye, feeling he knows what's coming. I do have some concerns about this hotel bill. Despite Jonathan's threats of legal action, the Guardian's investigation has become common knowledge. It's even being talked about in Westminster's corridors. The party can't handle any more controversy. Major fixes him with a look. Jonathan starts to worry that he knows something. About Jonathan's relationship with the Saudis, or... Aitken stops. He's being paranoid. He tells himself to get a grip decides to go on the offensive. Sir, frankly, I'm a little offended that you would entertain this witch hunt for even a second. These accusations are entirely unfounded. You know what the Guardian are like. Major studies him. They've been gunning for Tory ministers for years, but they have no evidence. Jonathan lets his words hang in the air. No evidence whatsoever because there's none to be found. Major hasn't moved. Jonathan worries he's overplayed his hand. He can see Major weighing up what he's been told. You better be telling me the truth here, Jonathan. Jonathan knows he can't back down now. Sir, as a party, we must stand united against these left-wing loonies. Otherwise, where does it end? Who will be next? Jonathan fixes his eyes on Major. Finally, Major nods. I couldn't agree more, Jonathan. The two men shake hands. And Jonathan steps back out in front of the scrum of journalists as Chief Secretary to the Treasury. Man, that's one of the great things about being a guy. You just tell another guy, yeah, don't worry about it. And he's like, here's a bigger job. And you high five, maybe a handful of salted nuts, throw a dart, not necessarily at a dartboard. Also, I love it that he's deeply untrustworthy because rumors are swirling, but it's like, Yeah, I think I'll just take you at your word. He did make and hold eye contact. (laughs) What a firm handshake. The next morning, Jonathan sits at the breakfast table looking at the photo of him, Lalicia, and the girls on the front page of the Daily Mail. All in their Sunday best. Above the photo is the headline, Who will succeed John Major? Step forward, Jonathan Aitken. The only cabinet minister who hasn't a single enemy. Has a headline that bombastic ever been followed by success or just always a downfall? Maybe if the person died right after they published it. (laughs) July 1994. The Channel. David Lee takes in the French coastline spreading out in front of him. In the past month, he's spoken to countless people from Aitken's past. Ex-girlfriends, business associates members of the local party. They all have stories about Aitken's links to the Saudis, but no one will go on record. Just yesterday, David was on the point of giving up, telling Preston there's nothing to publish, when he was given a name of someone who might speak. This is his last shot. David walks along a strip of seafront bars, passing through clouds of cigarette smoke. He finds the one he's looking for. Café de la Place, bangs on the door, but there's no answer. He's about to turn away when he sees movement in the back room. He bangs again, shouts through the letterbox. Excusez-moi, my name's David Lee. I'm here to see Sue Miller. Why do they both sound like friends of your mum and dad? Sue Miller would pick you up from school if your mum mm-hmm. had to stay late at work. <laughs> if someone is in there, they don't want to speak to him. Back out on the strip, David sits on a bench and looks out across the mass of umbrellas to the sea. He chucks his notebook on the pavement, then picks up a discarded newspaper beside him and sees Aitken's face smirking from the inside pages. The Tory golden boy who's just been promoted to the cabinet. David feels his blood boil. He can't give up. He ducks down the alleyway that runs behind the bars. And sure enough, 
on a step amongst the industrial bins and discarded cigarette ends, sits Sue Miller. Excuse me. The woman looks up like a rabbit in the headlights. We spoke on the phone. I was hoping to speak to you about Jonathan Aitken. David sees a look of disgust in her eyes. Like I told you, I want nothing to do with that man. David watches Sue grind her cigarette butt under her shoe. She presses it hard into the grimy cement. He can feel the anger coming off of her. He recognizes it. Sue stands to go back inside. I've spoken to so many people who've known him, and no one will go on record. I just need one person. Sue cuts him off. Well, it ain't me. The one time I called him out, he bloody sacked me. David takes a careful step forward. What did you call him out for? Oh, Sue, he's like a dog with a bone. We know this. Why did you even give him that morsel? Sue eyes him warily. He can see she wants to share her story. Can see she's fed up remaining silent. Look, I just need one person to speak up. Help me tell your story. This is our opportunity to get that bastard. After a moment, Sue beckons for him to follow her inside. She pours them both a pint and they sit down, her knuckles white around her glass. David listens as she tells him about Englewood. It was owned by the Saudis, but fronted by Aitken, who had to keep them happy. David sees her pause. He's an errand boy. If it's not girls, it's the buying of houses and offices. So Aitken is trusted by the Saudis. Yeah, because he also brokers deals for the government. Arms contracts, worth billions. I used to take calls from the PM at Englewood. David asks her the question he always dreads. Are you prepared to say all this on record? Sue looks down at her pint. He can see the weight of this decision. She looks around the room, then mutters, I forgot how much I hated him. Then nods a yes. David tries to hide his relief, because all he wants to do is rush out and find the nearest payphone to call Preston and tell him, We've got him. Hey, Dave. Yeah, Randy. Since we founded Bombas, we've always said our socks, underwear, and T-shirts are super soft. Any new ideas? Maybe sublimely soft. Or disgustingly cozy. Wait, what? I got it. Bombas. Absurdly comfortable essentials for yourself and everyone on your list. And for those facing homelessness. Because one purchased equals one donated. Wow, did we just write an ad? Yes. Bombas. Big comfort for everyone. Go to bombas.com slash Wondery and use code Wondery for 20% off your first purchase. There are so many amazing days on the way to your wedding day. And Zola's here for all of them. Like the day you find your perfect venue. The day you almost skip to the mailbox to send your invites. And the day you realize making a budget isn't so scary. Zola has everything you need to plan the wedding you want. Like a free website for your guests to RSVP and shop your registry. And those not-so-amazing days? Zola's here for those, too. Talk to Team Z, Zola's expert wedding advisors. Or join the Zola community, full of other engaged couples who know exactly what you're going through. From getting engaged to getting married, Zola is here for all the days along the way. Start planning at Zola.com. That's Z-O-L-A dot com. Tenth April, nineteen ninety five, Central London. Jonathan takes in the early morning commuters as his car races across London Bridge. He'd give anything to be one of the anonymous hordes on their way into the city. He stares again at the newspapers in his lap. Aitken arranged girls for Saudi friends. Aitken connection to second arms dealer disclosed. New light shed on who paid Aitken's Paris Ritz bill. <laughs> the old PRB. <laughs> <laughs> He's exhausted. He's raced back from Switzerland and all he wants to do is get home. My heart bleeds for him. His mind racing about who it is from his past who's spoken to the press. But given the details, he's got a pretty good bloody idea. As his car pulls up on Lord Street, he spots a scrum of journalists outside his house. He swears under his breath. He just wants to get inside and go up to his study. Half an hour's peace and he'll be able to come up with a plan. Are you a pimp, Mr. Aitken? Have you been taking Saudi backhanders? It's a relief when he shuts the front door behind him. Finally home. Safe. 
He enters the living room to find all the lights are off. On the sofa is a half-packed bag. It's Lolicia's. He turns around to find her standing in the doorway. He takes a step forward, but she pushes past him. Shoves a copy of The Guardian into his hands. Darling, they're lying. None of it's true. Lolicia shuts the bag and zips it up, not looking at him. It's the left-wing press trying to rip chunks out of me. You know what they're like. Lolicia points at a photo of a scantily clad woman. I know her. She turned up at the house once. Jonathan tries to defend himself, but Lelicia's not finished. While I was looking after our children, you were fucking some woman in our house. Now, as you know, as somebody with lots of kids, she's less angry about the fucking and more angry about the childcare bit. Am I right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, within a marriage, yes. The adultery, you're like, okay, yeah, yeah. fine, but I was looking after the kids and it wasn't my day. Keep in mind, I was inconvenienced. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I've never seen that woman before in my life. Lolisa ignores him. Instead, heaves her suitcase off the sofa. They say you procured prostitutes. How are you going to explain that to your teenage daughter? Jonathan feels a stab of guilt in his chest. He's about to answer when 14-year-old Victoria enters. She's in pajamas and bare feet, just woken up. Who are those men out there throwing things at my window? Lolisa goes to Victoria. Look what you've done. Look what you've brought to our door. Jonathan looks at his innocent wife and daughter and realizes that if he's going to save his family, let alone his career, he has to act now. So he's going to double down. All right. He's going to fight fire with fire. Okay. And crush these malicious, slanderous stories once and for all. All right. Oh, maybe not, actually. (laughs) That afternoon, central London. David Lee sits in a small office in Guardian HQ, staring at the large screen, dumbfounded. He watches in disbelief as Aitken stares down the camera lens as if directly at him. If it falls to me to cut out the cancer of bent and twisted journalism with the simple sword of truth and the trusty shield of British fair play, so be it. I am ready for the fight. The fight against falsehood and those who peddle it. My fight begins today. Wow, he was really not holding back. That is full GCSE drama. (laughs) Yeah, well, that was the sword of truth speech. That's what it's called. They named a name after what it is because it was so famous and bombastic and it didn't quite produce the results that he'd hoped. We'll find out later. I hope I'm not spoiling anything. No, you are. (laughs) David is speechless. Aitken is going to sue the Guardian for libel. David can't make sense of it. The idea of it is so preposterous. Suddenly the door swings open and the Guardian's fearsome solicitor, Geraldine Proudler, storms in. How long have you been in this job? David doesn't have time to reply. Did you send this to print without evidence? David stands up. I do have evidence. How is that possible given he's suing us? I've got the receipt, which you acquired by fraud. That won't stand up in court. But what about Sue Miller's testimony? Oh, that's it, is it? The Guardian's case rests entirely on the shoulders of one witness? She better be good, David. Proudler turns to go, too angry to even look at him. Else we're looking at losses of two million. The end of The Guardian. David scoffs. Don't be ridiculous. The man's a liar. He's a crook, and we've got the fucking evidence. Two hours later, David collapses on his sofa, exhausted. He pours himself a glass of scotch and mulls over Geraldine's words. Who does she think she's talking to? He's not some bloody amateur. He nevertheless decides to ease his racing mind. He picks up the phone. David? Sue, I don't know if you saw Aitken's speech this afternoon, but we've clearly got him rattled. He's on the back foot. There's a pause. You okay? Aitken's lot have been turning up at work, sending threatening letters. David can hear the panic in her voice. He puts his drink down. I'm sorry to hear that. Let me speak to... Sue cuts across him. I've forgotten how bad he can be. Okay, well... I'm not sure I can do this. David can feel his final bargaining chip slipping away. In fact, I can't. Sue! David practically shouts down the line, trying to stop her hanging up. I can't be a named witness. 
David stares at the dead receiver in his hand and realizes that if he has any chance of saving the situation, he needs a bloody miracle. August 1995, Piccadilly, London. David pulls at the sleeves on his suit. He hasn't worn it since a wedding two years ago and it's too small. He takes in the high-end decor of the restaurant. The floor-to-ceiling windows, vast chandelier, tiny portions of food on massive plates. He glances at the appetizers. What the hell is a cheese tweel? <laughs> I think you're asking the same question. He'd never normally be seen dead in a place like this, but he's hoping that meeting Aitken on his turf will work in his favor, because he needs to persuade Aitken to settle. David spent the past two days working on an out-of-court settlement with Geraldine Proudler. Without Sue, this is now the Guardian's only option. He feels like a bloody fool. To his amazement, Aitken's agreed to meet him for lunch. Except, he's 45 minutes late. In my book, that actually isn't too late. <laughs> I forgot you were half Spanish. <laughs> David knocks back the last of his wine. He's about to stand and leave when he sees a man making a beeline for him. In a floor-length black coat, British businessman and art dealer Maurice Saatchi cuts an intimidating figure. He hands his coat to a waiter and sits down at the table, straightens his red, square-framed glasses, and gives David a fox-like smile. Saatchi is a notorious Tory donor and close friend of Jonathan Aitken, who, he informs David, is too busy on the election trail to meet for lunch. Saatchi's come instead. So, what do you have to tell me, Mr. Lee? David burns with rage, but he's not going to let these rich men get the better of him. He knows how they operate and he won't be intimidated. He begins to lay out his proposed settlement, but is quickly cut off by Saatchi ordering a steak and a bottle of Chateau Lafitte Rothschild. Do continue. David grinds his jaw. Each side walks away, pays their own costs. The Guardian won't apologize, but will agree to a face-saving formula which will leave Aitken's reputation intact. There's a long pause as Saatchi pours wine, swirls it in the bottom of his glass, smells it, then knocks it back. When Saatchi still doesn't reply, David adds, We know Aitken's scared. He's been seen in the public gallery watching our law in action. A waiter brings Saatchi's steak, which he tucks into. Is there a greater power move than just eating a steak while somebody tries to convince you to help them? Maybe like a horse steak? <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, he puts down his knife and fork. Mr. Lee, if you're concerned about being responsible for running the left's much-loved paper into the ground, then perhaps you should have thought of that before publishing unsubstantiated lies. As Saatchi smirks, David feels anger rise. I'll let Jonathan know that you're quite clearly shitting it, but no, he won't settle. At that moment, David loses his composure. Of course he won't! Because when he's swimming in Saudi backhand, does he can afford to lose a libel trial, right? Saatchi takes out a cigarette and smiles. Careful, Mr. Lee. Those are some very powerful people you're slandering. The waiter puts the bill on the table. Saatchi finishes the last of the wine and tells the waiter David will be paying. Thanks for lunch. Oh no, that's a power play. <laughs> As David watches Saatchi retrieve his coat and stroll out of the door, he seethes with anger. He's out of options. The only thing he can do now is take Aitken on in court. He's going to prove to the country that Jonathan Aitken is a liar. And just hope he's not put the nail in the coffin of the Guardian and his own career. September 1995, Lord North Street, London. Lolicia looks out of the window at the horde of journalists. It seems to get bigger and more aggressive every day. One of them spots her, points up and shouts. Then they're all looking, waving and jeering, telling her to come down. In a moment of defiance, Lolicia gives them the finger. In response, a man holds up a copy of The Sun. The headline, Aitken's Fling with Vice Girl. And none of them like, Aitken helped a cat out of a tree. Mm -hmm. Aitken uses a bag for life. Like, where's the good stuff? That's just him hanging out with this superhero I had not heard of before named Vice Girl. <laughs> Lolicia steps away from the window. She's decided to take Jonathan at his word, but the sheer number of stories is taking its toll. She controls her breathing, decides to take a bath, unwind. 
A few minutes later, she feels her body relax as she sinks into the water, the smell of patchouli incense filling the air. Then the door opens and Jonathan enters. Darling, can I have a quick word? He turns off the radio and sits on the edge of the bath. I saw the front page of the sun today. One of our friends downstairs showed it to me. Jonathan shakes his head in disgust. I don't know how they think this fills up. Or how they sleep at night, printing lie after lie trying to destroy my life. Lalicia studies him, notices the way he turns and fiddles with a candlestick on the fireplace. Thank heavens you and I have such a solid bond. Listen, darling, I need to ask you something. Our court case is coming along well. The Guardian haven't got a leg to stand on. Lalicia smiles. She'll be so glad when this is all over. The only issue is the business of the Paris Ritz Hotel bill. Why? Well, old Sai did pay it, didn't he? Except I've already told the Guardian that you paid it. Oh, yes, and this is the moment that I always like in these stories where you incriminate your wife. What? She sits bolt upright. Why? Because if I admit Sai paid it and it'll look like all the other stuff, the arms dealers, the prostitutes, the, the backhanders, is all true as well. Lalicia feels a knot form in the pit of her stomach. She knows what's coming. So, I'm going to need you to sign a witness statement. Tell them you paid for it. I was in Switzerland with Victoria that weekend. Well, we'll just say you popped back to pay it. Will anyone believe that? No. Of course. Lolisa's heart is racing. He's asking her to commit perjury. Darling, you're not going to get in any trouble here. But we do need to do this to, to protect the children. There it is. Lolisa doesn't meet his eye. Sleep on it. I'll leave you in peace. He squeezes her shoulder and disappears. Lolisi gets out of the bath and decides to try to sleep. But two hours later, she's still awake. She rolls out of bed and pads down the stairs. She needs Jonathan to come to bed to get some rest. There's light on in his study. She hears whispering and shuffles forward. Here's a note of frustration in Jonathan's voice. She edges even nearer. She was just some bloody prostitute years ago. Obviously it meant nothing. Pay her off and get rid of her. Lilicia stumbles silently away from the door, puts a hand to her mouth to stifle a sob. She realizes her husband isn't just lying to her, he's lying to the entire country. And she won't be taken for a fool. She's going to tell the truth. She'll tell them all what Jonathan Aitken is really like. Holiday stress is real, and self-care is important. This season, do something special for yourself and get a confident new smile with Bite Clear Aligners. They cost thousands less than traditional braces, and now you can save up to $600 on your treatment journey during the Time Is Now sale. Order your at-home impression kit today for just $14.95. Save $250 on clear aligners. Get $120 off the Bite Protection Plan and claim a free LED whitening kit worth $150. Use code NOW23 at Byte.com. That's B-Y-T-E dot com. Plus, you can upgrade your oral care routine with 25% off best-selling wellness, whitening, and cleaning essentials. Be confident. Be you. With Byte. May 1996, the High Court, London. Jonathan grips Lolicia's hand, grins broadly as they push through the scrum of journalists. Are you standing by your man, Mrs. Aitken? His smile falters. He still doesn't know if Lolicia is going to help him in court. He turns around to look at her, but she stares at the ground, pulling her tweed jacket closer to her body. Can you imagine asking your wife to do that, but also not knowing if your wife's going to do that? Ugh. I would totally do it for my wife, but I, would be, I wouldn't want to ask her to do it for me. And you kind of know that she wouldn't. <laughs> oh, I know she wouldn't. Absolutely not. She's hardly spoken to him since she overheard him on the phone. But he's had bigger fish to fry. In the past few months, it feels like Jonathan's entire life has fallen apart. The Tories have just lost the general election. He's lost his seat. And this morning, the sun branded him the poster boy of sleaze. He needs today to go well. During his cross-examination, Jonathan looks at Lolicia, sat on the hard benches in court, still avoiding his gaze. 
He shifts his weight from one foot to the other in the witness box as his eyes flit back to the Guardian's voracious barrister, George Carmen. Mr. Aitken, who paid your Paris Ritz hotel bill? Jonathan clears his throat. My wife paid the bill. She flew from Switzerland to Paris to pay it. And I know that doesn't sound believable, but I'm sticking with that story. She flew on the back of a large albatross, which, if you're not aware, can in fact carry a full-grown human woman. The court falls deathly silent. He watches the gallery's eyes turn toward Lolicia. She remains fixed to the spot, eyes down. Then her head snaps up, locking eyes with him. He's shocked by the look of defiance on her face. Jonathan's stomach turns. What if she speaks out now, denies she was in Paris? His case would collapse, and with it, any remaining integrity. He realizes with terror that he should have pleaded with her more, convinced her. He watches her shuffle uneasily in her seat. But then she sits back, resumes her downward gaze. Jonathan fights to hide a victorious grin. George Carmen splutters, incredulous. Would you mind repeating that? Jonathan sticks out his chin. My wife paid the bill. We have nothing to hide. As murmurs spread around the court, he hears a nearby journalist mutter. Well, that's the Guardian, fucked. In that moment, Jonathan knows he's won. Sure, Lolicia might be angry at him involving her, but she'll forgive him. She always does. Lying is a small price to pay for his freedom. The next day, Lord North Street, London. Jonathan ducks as the plate flies past him and hits the wall. Okay, things have escalated quite quickly. Lelicia is already reaching for the next bit of crockery. Stop, darling, please. Lelicia picks up the plate. You've lied to me, to the girls, to the entire fucking country. Another piece of bone china explodes against the wall. I can't talk to you when you're like this. Jonathan storms out of the breakfast room, heads upstairs to his study. There's no reasoning with her. He'll just have to ride this out. <laughs> it's just so ridiculous that this is his thinking. He knows she's angry, but he didn't have a choice. In time, she'll see that. He'll take her on holiday to make it up to her. Oh my god, I actually, can I punch the microphone? Is that allowed? You may. Because right now, he has to focus on his final day of questioning. If he can get through today without a slip-up, then he's home and dry. Two hours later, he's back in the witness box. In truth, it feels easier in the witness box than it does in his own house. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> His friends are going to Ascot this weekend. He wonders whether it would be too late to try to get tickets for him and Lelicia. He looks across at the Guardian's lawyer, Carmen, who is looking at him, holding up a document. Jonathan forces himself to refocus. I have irrefutable proof, Your Honor, that Mrs. Lelicia Aitken was not present in Paris on Sunday, 19th September, to pay the Ritz Hotel bill. Jonathan snaps, too, glances in panic at his lawyer. Then at Lelicia. He feels a tightening in his chest. These are phone records that show that at 10.15 a.m. on Sunday, 19th September, Mr. Aitken made a phone call to the hotel in Switzerland where Mrs. Lolicia Aitken was staying whilst dropping her daughter at boarding school. How on earth, Mr. Aitken, could your wife have been in Switzerland at 10.15 but in Paris at 1 p.m. to pay your bill? It's a fair point, Rob. <laughs> But also the Concord is not yet been decommissioned at this point. Okay. It's something to think about. We've still got okay. hope. Or does he have access to fighter jets? He is an MP. Your determination <laughs> to make him innocent is <laughs> chilling. Jonathan tries to keep a neutral expression fixed on his face, but his mind is blank. He feels the eyes of the court on him as he desperately tries to think of an explanation. The silence is unbearable. After what feels like an eternity he realizes he has to say something. He manages to somehow keep his voice measured, assured. Well, <clears throat> Mr. Carmen, that was not a phone call to my wife. Okay, we hadn't thought of this route. He's still not sure what he's going to say. <laughs> I respect that, just start. It was a phone call to my mother-in-law. Oh. Carmen almost laughs. Sorry. We've been discussing your wife's trip to Switzerland all week, and you're only telling us now that her mother was also there. Jonathan nods. Yes, 
George Carmen sits down, shaking his head incredulously. He's got no further questions. Jonathan glances at his lawyer, who's stony-faced. Jonathan fixes his own expression, determined not to give an inch. As they file out for lunch, his lawyer whispers, You better have some bloody good evidence to back that up, or you may as well pack your prison bag now. Jonathan nods, then ducks into a nearby bathroom and throws up in a basin. Because right now, he doesn't have a damn thing. That evening, Lord North Street. Jonathan creeps through the front door. He can't handle another fight with Lolicia. So he's delighted when he's greeted by the smell of sizzling garlic and cheese. His 16-year-old daughter, Victoria, appears in an apron. How was it, Daddy? He smiles. Uh, you know, getting there. Where's your mother? She went out. She didn't say where she was going. Jonathan knows she must be furious. Dinner's ready in ten. I've made lasagna. Jonathan flops into an armchair. His eyes land on Jeffrey Archer's latest novel. Oh, Rob, as you all know, we've done a series on Archer. Actually, a lot of the same playbook going on here between Archer and Aitken. Very kindred spirits. He thinks about Archer's libel trial in 1987. His wife Mary was his strongest witness and ultimately won it for him. The fragrant Mary Archer, as she was referred to. He hears Victoria singing to herself lightly in the kitchen, and a thought comes to him. Jonathan stands, then paces the house for a few minutes. He double-checks that Lolicia really is out. He doesn't want her to hear what he's about to ask his daughter. Oh my God, no! I forgot this bit! Oh. Then he slinks back into the kitchen, looks at Victoria, who last week featured in the society pages of Tattler. Innocence itself. Surely her integrity couldn't be questioned. I feel sick. And she'd only be on the stand for a minute. Yes, because it's the length of time you're on the stand. That's how they measure it. That's yep. crucial, yep. yeah. The shorter the time, the truthler mirror it is. Exactly. The judge wouldn't see her attacked by that brute Carmen. She could win this case for him. OK, I think maybe we should all just have a little sit down, a little cup of tea, a little snooze even, because we've lost our remains. Over dinner, Victoria asks him again if he's enjoying the lasagna. It's delicious, my love. You've outdone yourself. Do you know what I also like? You defending me in court, just like a seamless... It's just an idea, yeah. <laughs> Do you know what this layered lasagna <laughs> reminds me of? The layers of my defence, one of which could yeah. be you. Victoria smiles proudly. I wanted to ask if you might help me with something. Of course, Daddy. You remember that trip to Switzerland in 1993 when Mummy was taking you to boarding school? Victoria nods. I need you to say that Granny was there as well. A look of confusion crosses Victoria's face. To who? Jonathan remains silent. He sees a look of discomfort appear as the penny drops. In court? But she wasn't there, Daddy. Victoria, my darling, you seem to be missing the point. Mm, I know, but if we want this case to be all over and our lives to go back to normal, I need you to tell a little white lie for me and Mummy. Victoria looks at him, doe-eyed. I don't want to get into trouble. No, oh, darling, you won't get into any trouble. It's merely paperwork. But you do trust me, don't you? Jonathan watches his daughter nod. Of course, Daddy. Later that night, Jonathan picks up the phone and calls his lawyer. Victoria is going to take the stand tomorrow alongside Lalicia. Jonathan hears the uncertainty in his lawyer's voice. You are sure about this, Jonathan? Absolutely. And call the press. We're going to call it... Ladies' Day. This is the second episode in our series, The Aitken Affair. A quick note about our dialogue. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said or where. It's a dramatisation inspired by historical events. If you'd like to know more about this story, you can read Pride and Perjury by Jonathan Aitken and The Liar, The Fall of Jonathan Aitken by David Lee David Pallister, and Luke Harding. I'm Alice Levine. And I'm Rob Delaney. British Scandal is a production of Wondery and Audio. Jess Green wrote this episode. Additional writing by Alice Levine and Rob Delaney. Our sound design is by Rich Evans. Script editing by James Magniak. This episode was produced by Millie Chu. Our associate producer is Francesca Gilardi-Quardio-Curzio. 
Our senior producer is Joe Sykes. Our series producer is Theodora Leludis for Wondery. Our executive producers are Rich Knight, Jessica Radburn, and Marsha Louie for Wondery. Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. Hey, I'm Marisha. And I'm Brooke. And we're the hosts of Wondery's podcast, Even the Rich, where we bring you absolutely true and absolutely shocking stories about the most famous families and biggest celebrities the world has ever seen. Our newest series is all about the royal spare Prince Harry. Stalked by grief and terrorized by the press, he grew up as the black sheep of the British royal family. But when he finally pushes through his stoic exterior and lets his feelings in, he'll have to make a choice he never thought he'd face. In our series, Prince Harry, Windsor of Change, we'll tell you how Harry discarded years of tradition to find the happiness he always craved. Follow Even the Rich on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge Even the Rich and Prince Harry, Windsor of Change early and ad-free right now on Wondery+. Plus.